Hello everyone. So today we are going to start with ENT and the first condition that we are going to start in ENT is vertigo or dizziness. Now this is a very, very important topic and I want all of you to prepare this very well. So vertigo and dizziness, these are the two terms that are used interchangeably, but vertigo is more of a specific term and dizziness is more of a wake or layman term. So vertigo means that the patient feels like everything around him is spinning. While dizziness can mean either vertigo, that is the patient is feeling that he, that he, everything around him is spinning, or dizziness can also mean that the patient feels that he is going to pass out. Now, as dizziness is a layman term and the patient is going to, you know, talk to you in layman term, so uh, more often than not, the patient will tell you, doctor, I'm feeling dizzy, okay? The patient will not tell you, the doctor, I'm feeling vertigo. He will tell you, doctor, I'm feeling dizzy. So whenever you hear the word, I'm feeling dizzy, the first thing that you need to ask is, can you please tell me what do you mean by feeling dizzy, okay? Do you feel like you're going to pass out or faint or do you feel like everything around you is spinning? Okay, now when you hear the word dizzy, you should think of three organs, okay? Ear, brain, and heart. Okay? Mostly when you... Um, mostly when you think of vertigo, the first thing that comes in our mind is ear disease, okay? But you should also think about brain disease and you all should also think about heart disease. If you only ask about symptom of ear disease during history taking in a patient with vertigo, despite all your history taking, you will get two marks in the data gathering because you have forgotten about the other two organs. Now, in ear and brain disease, you the patient gets true vertigo, while in cardiovascular diseases, like in heart block or in arrhythmias where the patient gets syncope or in anemia, the patient feel like he is going to faint. This is not a true vertigo. In heart disease, there is no true vertigo. In ear, in brain disease, there is true vertigo. However, you need to exclude uh, all these three organs while taking the history. So let's talk about differentials now. The differentials in ear disease that causes vertigo are five, which is BPPV, Meniere's disease, vestibular neuritis, labyrinthitis, and acoustic neuroma. In brain, you need to rule out stroke and TIA, particularly the posterior circulation stroke, because posterior circulation stroke involves cerebellum and the brain stem. That's why it causes vertigo and balance problem. Uh, in cardiovascular diseases, you need to ask about anemia and you need to ask about arrhythmia. So the, you should ask this in one simple question. Uh, do you feel any heart racing? And this will rule out cardiovascular diseases that causes dizziness. Okay, now let's talk about history of presenting illness. So whenever a patient presents to you with vertigo or dizziness, the first question you will ask is open-ended question. Can you please tell me what do you mean by dizziness? Uh, can you please tell me a bit more about it? After this, as usual, you will ask about odipara, that is onset, duration, intensity, progression, aggravating factor, a relieving factor, and anything else. Now, as you all know by anything else, we mean the DD questions. So let's discuss the DDs. Uh, so if the patient tells you that the vertigo is precipitated by head movements, okay, and it is episodic, but the episodes are very brief, that is the last for seconds, Okay, for seconds or up to a minute. So very brief episodes. This is going to be BPPV, okay? If the patient tell you that there, is, there was a recent viral infection of the upper respiratory tract, so there was a recent flu, and he has vertigo that has been there for the last two days, like very prolonged vertigo. So duration is all two days, most probably days. So this can be two things. It can be vestibular neuritis or it can be labyrinthitis. Now, how to differentiate between these two? So in vestibular neuritis, only the vestibular part of the eighth nerve is involved, which is responsible for balance. In vestibular neuritis, you are only going to get vertigo. Whereas in labyrinthitis, not only there is vertigo, but there is also hearing loss because labyrinth is involved, which is uh, labyrinth is the organ of the inner ear that you know control both the uh, balance function and the hearing function. So in uh, labyrinthitis, you are going to have prolonged vertigo along with hearing loss and a recent history of viral flu. Now, if you have hearing loss along with vertigo, you have hearing loss and you, you are going to have ringing sensation in the inner ear and fullness in the inner ear, then it means that you have Meniere's disease. Okay, So in Meniere's disease, there are 
uh, four symptoms. Number one is vertigo. Number two is hearing loss. Then there is fullness sensation in the ear and uh, ring and sensation in the ear, which is tinnitus. In Meniere's, the symptoms are episodic. Okay, so symptoms are episodic like BPPV, but they are more prolonged. They are from minutes to hours. So BPPV has the shortest duration. It is very brief from seconds to up to a minute. Then there is Meniere's, which is from minutes to hours. Then the vertigo of vestibular neuritis is very prolonged and it lasts for days. The fifth and the last differential is acoustic neuroma, which is competitively rare. Uh, so in acoustic neuroma, as we all know, it is a cerebellopontine angle tumor. Okay, and this involves, first of all, very early on, it involved the eighth nerve. Okay, so it causes hearing loss and vertigo. Then it involved the uh, seventh nerve as well. So it causes facial weakness because seventh nerve is responsible for facial muscle function. So it causes facial weakness. Then it involved the fifth nerve as well, which is a trigeminal nerve responsible for facial sensation. So it causes facial numbness or facial pain. Okay. And then it can go on to involve the ninth, tenth nerve, which are responsible for swallowing. So it can cause swallowing difficulties. So this is basically a caustic neuroma. Now, in order to rule out stroke, you will ask the patient, do you feel any weakness in any part of the body? And this will rule out stroke. In order to rule out the heart diseases, you will ask about heart tracing. So these were the DD's questions. And this is your history of presenting illness. Then you will ask P2, which is the past history. Uh, you will ask if you have if the patient has ever experienced these symptoms before and any um, ear disease, any heart disease, any diabetes, any hypertension, etc. Then medications, allergies, family history, and psychosocial. Now, psychosocial is very, very important here. You cannot miss psychosocial in cases of vertigo. You must ask the patient who do you live with and are you able to manage your activities of daily living because vertigo is a very debilitating condition. So you need to ask the patient, are you able to manage your activities of daily living? The other thing is you must ask about the patient's job. Okay. Because, for example, if the patient is a driver or the patient is working on heights or if the patient is working with heavy machinery, you will need to tell him to stop all these until his symptoms are resolved. Because, for example, think of a BPPV patient who is driving. He turns his head to check in the mirror and he gets this attack and he's involved in an accident. Or he is working on a height and he turns his head and he falls down to the ground uh, from a three-story building. Okay, Or he's um, working with heavy machinery and he gets this episode of vertigo and he's crushed by the machinery. Okay, So vertigo patient, you will advise to stop driving. You will advise to stop working on height. And you will advise them to stop working with heavy machinery until their symptoms are resolved. And this is very important if you forget to, uh, you know, advise this patient about these safety measures, then you will not be a safe doctor. Then lifestyle questions that is smoking, alcohol, food, and exercise. Then ideas, concerns, and expectation. You will ask these ideas, concerns, and expectations. Then you will go on to examination. So you will examine the vitals. You will examine the ear. In general, you will exam. You will do dick salpike maneuver only if you are suspecting BPPV. If you are not suspecting BPPV from your history, you will not do dick salpike maneuver because this is basically a diagnostic test for BPPV. Okay, hearing test you will do in all patients. Neurological examination you will do in all patients. And cardiovascular examination you will do in all patients. So the rest of these uh, five you will do in all patients. But dick salpike maneuver only if you think that the patient has BPPV because this is basically confirmatory for BPPV. Okay, now let's uh, discuss the management of these conditions one by one. So let's start with benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. Um, so as I've already told you, we start our management by explaining the condition to the patient. Okay. So how to explain BPPV in simple words? You will tell the patient that you have a condition of the inner ear which causes spinning sensation whenever you move your head. As simple as that. Condition of the inner ear, which causes spinning sensation whenever you move your head. It is called BPPV, or benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. And you will tell, tell him uh, no one really knows why it happens, but some debris inside the inner ear have moved from one part of the inner ear to another where they shouldn't be. And this is causing uh, this vertigo. You'll tell him that usually it resolves on its own. However, I will inform my senior and they will perform some movement on your head. And this is called as Epley maneuver and that can resolve it rapidly. So, in, you know, inside the GP clinic, GP can perform Epley maneuver. So we'll tell him that uh, my senior will perform this maneuver for you. Okay. 
uh, within 24 hours of the Ibn maneuver, you will advise him to uh, not look far up as if looking at the sky or not look far down as if tying your shoe okay, or picking something up from the ground and don't turn your head quickly. So after 24 hours of the Apple maneuver, we will advise him to uh, not look far down, not look far up, not turn your head quickly. Okay, So he needs to maintain this certain posture for 24 hours he can um you know he can sleep in whatever position he likes at night but advise him not to lie very flat so you know keep his head a little bit elevated and of course you will advise him to and not do not drive do not upgrade heavy machinery do not work on height until the symptoms are fully resolved you will tell him that there are some exercises that you can try at home as well and i will give you a leaflet about it these are called as branded dwarf exercises uh, I told you for your information, but you don't need to tell the patient the name of the exercise. You just tell him that there are some exercises that you can try at home as well to quickly resolve your symptom. And these are called as branded direct exercises. Tell him that if the symptom persists or they recur, please come back. Now, basically, according to NHS website, uh, BPPV is a fairly common condition. So they suggest that 50% of the population, that is half of the population, is going to get one attack of BPPV at some point in their life. Okay, so half there is half of the population, and out of them, thirty percent will have another episode. That is, there is thirty percent recurrent rate, recurrence rate. So fairly common condition with a fairly common recurrent uh, recurrence rate. So ask him if it recurs, please come back. Tell him that even if it recurs, the good news is it's uh, the treatment is very simple, and it gets cured very uh, treated very quickly. If the symptom persists even after four weeks, then you need to refer to the ENT. Okay, now some people talk about prochlorperazine or antihistamine, but according to NICE case guidelines, it is not recommended. You can only give it for short duration, but not for longer duration. It causes side effect. NICE case guidelines don't even recommend it. Okay. According to NICE case, the only treatment for BPPV is a please maneuver or branded derive exercises. Okay, now many years disease. So how you are going to explain it to the patient? You will tell the patient that you have a condition of the inner ear that can result in repeated attack of spinning and problem with hearing, okay? Simple explanation. Condition of the inner ear that can result in repeated attacks of spinning and problem with hearing. It is thought to be due to poor fluid drainage in the inner ear, okay? So no need to go into a lot of details that there is an inner, that there is a tubing inside the inner ear and then there is fluid produced and then it is drained and blah, blah, blah. Just tell him that it's thought to be due to poor fluid drainage in your inner ear. You also need to explain that there is no cure for Meniere's disease. However, uh, the treatment can control the symptoms, okay? So if this patient presents to the GP, you are going to give him antihistamines, that is prochlorperazine to control the symptoms of uh, nausea, vomiting, and vertigo. But uh, for confirmation of diagnosis, you need to refer this patient to ENT. So in GP, antihistamines, but you need to refer this patient to ENT. The ENT will do MRI scan and audiometry for the diagnosis. And this reference needs to be urgent referral, okay? So urgent referral to ENT for MRI scan and audiometry. And meanwhile, you will give prochlorperazine and you will give safety advice. You will, you will give some lifestyle advices as well. So because um, Meniere's is exacerbated by uh, alcohol and caffeinated drinks, tell them avoid caffeinated drinks, avoid alcohol, avoid smoking, and don't drive if you feel dizzy, don't work on heights, don't operate heavy machinery, okay? You will ask them to keep their medications with them at all time and take them if they are feeling dizzy and um, tell them to drink lots of fluids. Now, vestibular neuritis or labyrinthitis. So in vestibular neuritis and labyrinthitis, the treatment is basically the same, but how you are going to explain it to the patient will be different in both of these. So in vestibular neuritis, you will tell the patient that you have a condition that affects the vestibular nerve, which is the nerve that is responsible for balance, and this is causing prolonged episode of vertigo. So condition that affects the vestibular nerve. And labyrinthitis, you will tell them that you have a condition that affects the labyrinth, which is the balance and hearing organ of the inner ear. And this is causing this prolonged episode of vertigo and hearing loss. In both of these, you will tell them that they are triggered by recent viral flu. Okay, Treatment will be the same. Now, in 
vestibular neuritis and vibrantitis, there is severe vertigo, severe debilitating prolonged vertigo, and the patient has been vomiting and vomiting and very dehydrated, and they present to the ER, okay? So what you are going to do, you are going to admit these patients. Okay, you are going to admit this patient, you are going to refer them to the ENT. So this is going to be internal referral. Internal referral, uh, by internal referral, I mean that um, they are going to be, they are going to present in the ER. In the ER, they will be, uh, the, they will call the ENT in the ER, they will assist this patient and they will admit them to the ENT department. Okay, the ENT ward. Um, they've been vomiting a lot. We are going to give them IV fluids. We are going to give them antihistamines, but they are going to be either IM or submucosal because they have been vomiting. Okay, um, these patients tend to have a little bit of vertigo, residual vertigo upon discharge. So if this is the case, then you will refer to the vestibular rehabilitation program. Vestibular rehabilitation program basically have vestibular physiotherapists that perform specific exercises on these patients and help them to improve their symptoms quickly. They will give them the same safety advice of not driving, not operating heavy machinery, not working on heights, and ask them to uh, follow up with your GP upon discharge, okay? Now, the last differential of vertigo in ear disease is acoustic neuroma. So acoustic neuroma, as you all know, that it is a cerebellopontine angle tumor. So how you are going to explain it to the patient? I have not written it here because it's a relatively rare condition, but I will explain it to you, um, you know, explain the management on how you are going to explain it to the patient. So to the patient, you will tell that you have a, I suspect that you have, because in GP you cannot confirm. So you'll tell the patient, unfortunately, I'm very sorry to tell you, but I suspect that you have um, a tumor of um, your brain, part of your brain uh, that is causing all these symptoms. So I need to refer you to the ENT urgently within two weeks uh, for confirmation, okay? You will tell him that uh, this is your suspicion and uh, it may or may not be the case. However, this is the worst possible scenario and we need to rule it out, okay? Regarding the management, so ENT will do MRI scan of the cerebellopontine angle, and if the diagnosis is confirmed, then the treatment is obviously surgery. Okay. Uh, now, I wanted to tell you about the cardinal symptom of ear disease. So there are basically six cardinal symptoms of ear disease. That is hearing loss, vertigo, ringing sensation in the ear, numbness on the face, weakness on the face, and balance problems. So sometime if you are not able to pinpoint your diagnosis on a specific disease or you think that you don't remember the management. So here is a trick. If you have a patient with hearing loss plus any of the additional problem, okay, hearing loss plus one, one of these, then you will refer urgently to ENT, okay? Hearing loss plus one of these, urgent referral to ENT because when you think about it, if you're hearing loss and vertigo, hearing loss and vertigo, then most probably means labyrinthitis, which you need to refer to ENT and needs to get admitted in order to be treated. If you're hearing loss and ringing sensation, it might mean Meniere's disease, which again need to, to be urgently referred to ENT. If you're hearing loss, numbness on the face, or hearing loss and weakness of the face, then this can mean that... Uh, this is basically acoustic neuroma, which again needs to be referred urgently to ENT. So this was one of the trick. And this was all about vertigo. So guys, if you like this video and you think it was helpful, then please leave a comment or press the like button because this way it will help it to reach more people who might need it. Um, so this was basically all about vertigo and I'll see you with the next video.